is going to talk about from novice to, to navigator an iterative approach to steering the OMSF community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, well, we're small but mighty today. Thank you for attending. Um, dije que hablaría en español durante esta presentación. Don't miss me. Um, lo siento. Um, las cosas uh, en mi presentación son difíciles para mí explicar en español. So I'm just going to speak in English the whole time. Um, I promise next time I get to talk, I will talk more in Spanish. Um, another disclaimer that I'd like to offer. Uh, it says navigator, but um, I'm still learning. So I've only been here for about a year. Um, and I'm just going to share with you a couple of things that I've learned throughout this process. Um, we're going to start with my background so that you get some familiarity with where I'm coming from. You'll learn how I approach my job uh, very briefly. I'll walk you through my organization and how it, it's formed and how it's structured and how I learned about it. And then it'll be story time. We'll talk a little bit about uh, some examples I've used in how I approach my job to solve problems at OMSF. Okay, so um, I am uh, not specialized at all. I have this weird mishmash of skills that I've acquired over like 12 years that have really nothing to do with each other. Um, I started out just kind of slinging beers and playing music for people, but I felt really energized when I was communicating with people. It was something that I really wanted to do, so I decided to go to college and study molecular sciences. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good joke, right? Because it has nothing to do with it, but there is something magical about learning, about how things work, and it was something that I was really passionate about. Um, and when that came crashing into the ground during the pandemic, I had to make a complete switch in how I thought about um, my career. And so I took this product management um, mindset to everything, and I started consulting with startups and talking to them about what their business needs were, and um, all the while, I was thinking like, okay, where is this magical space for me that exists at the center? And I was looking for about a year to find something, and maybe you guys are familiar with this, but it just like, is very rare. It's not a thing that actually really exists. And so I was kind of struggling with this, and I was talking to a mentor, and he was like, I know this nonprofit, and they need somebody that can talk to people, talk to scientists, and figure out what they need. I was like, that sounds great. I would love to do that. What's the job? And he said, community manager. I was like, what is that? I have no idea what that means. So I did a little bit of digging, and I'll let you read it. Um, a community manager, it's just this. You can find this definition on CSCCE's website. There. It's a really great resource. Um, and I read this, and I was like, OK, that sounds exactly like what I want to do. That is the middle of the circles. Um, and so I met with my boss now my boss, and we clicked, and I got the job a couple weeks later. And I was ecstatic because I got to be doing all of this. But I had a question, and how do you actually do the job? Like, once you get the job, like, you have to actually do it. Um, and my answer on day one was, just do it. Um, but not, like, without any guidance. I had all these skills to fall back on, and so I took this product management approach to communicating with molecular scientists. Um, and I'll go through that methodology really quickly. Uh, you'll see this on the website, if you, or website, on the internet, if you Google product management. Um, in like, you'll have four steps, five steps, six steps. I break it down just like this. First, you learn everything you can. Then you prioritize your findings. You communicate those priorities, and then you execute on them. It's just this nice circular loop, and then you come back to learning about it, right? And it's guided by what I call the three I's, which is just iterate, iterate, iterate. Yeah, you go around the circle, and you iterate. And then you iterate in between each step, so it goes back and forth. And then you can iterate inside each step. You can always be learning. And you can always learn the wrong thing and then relearn. If you learn something and you have a different priority, someone might tell you, oh, go back and learn something. 
And then once you do the whole cycle, you just start over again. And that's how I approached it from day one. So I had to learn, and I had no idea what OMSF was. So in the first month, this is what I learned. There is this center space, just like me, between academia, industry, and open science, open software, open data. And that's where OMSF is. It sits right at that intersection. And that was not enough knowledge to do my job. So I learned more. I iterated. Turns out, in my second month, I was able to master this. OMSF is a fiscal sponsor. If, you, if you've heard the term, um, Congratulations, it's very rare. Uh, it's not easy to explain, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, basically, a bunch of really smart people have really great ideas. And those ideas turn into projects. Um, now these projects are typically academically motivated, but they wanna be sustainable outside of the lab. So they have to be attractive. And that's where OMSF is able to grab industry dollars. There are bio, um, bio industries, drug development industries that are interested in what these technologies can do for them and how they can look up under the hood and see how academics actually develop these processes. And OMSF is good at this. In the last year, we added a couple more projects um, and we're really proud of them. Um, and that's what I learned about two months in. Uh, that was not enough to learn how to do my job. So I just kept learning. And I started with people. And now you can see that OMSF is not just a fiscal sponsor, but it's a collection of people who are really passionate about the work they're doing. They're passionate about science. They're passionate about open software. They're passionate about uh, bringing the best solutions to industry. And I started talking to them pretty early on, and it was all nice and rosy. <laughs> they had really great things to say about each other, about people, about industry, about software, and they kept coming back to these things. And that was great. But I still didn't really know much about my job, so I iterated again on learning. And the mandate that I had in the back of my head was like, we have to make sure that everybody's working together. We've got software pipelines that go from protein folding all the way to parameterizing force fields all the way to calculating free energies for drug design. That's great. But the people have to be able to talk. And basically what I'm getting is that they do. They do communicate. Something wasn't really working. As I was learning more, it almost felt like these projects were in their own silos, that they existed almost independently of each other, and it just happened to be represented by the fiscal sponsor, which is quite common if you look at different, like um, Focus or other fiscal sponsors, this is common. But we wanted the thing on the left. It just wasn't really happening. And I had no idea why. but I had an idea. I thought maybe this community of communities wasn't necessarily ready to be a community of communities. It, it, like this. Like some communities, maybe Project A, is all interconnected and they feel really strong about each other and they, they can rely on each other and they communicate in this sort of free sort of way. But if Project B can't do that, then there's probably not a through line between this communication. And so we would have to make sure that communities individually are strong before we make our community of communities strong. But I kind of needed proof that this was true. This is just a hypothesis, just an idea. So I learned this, and this was about month five of me being in my job, so slow going, but I'm learning what I can. And then something broke. After six months, we implemented Clockify. If you guys don't know what Clockify is, it's a time tracker. And we were doing this to win federal grant money. We were trying to prove that we were an effective organization working on the things that uh, the government wants us to work on so that we could get more money, so we could be sustainable. And I saw everybody's time reports. And everything was normal except this one guy. This one guy was working 60 hour weeks, like consistently. And we're a remote organization with a limited PTO. We're open, so why are you like, doing this? Why are you stressing out? And at first I was like angry, like I was a little bit. And then I just kind of got sad. <laughs> Nobody should be working 60 hour weeks regardless of where you are, right? And so I had a new priority. 
And that was to make sure this guy's okay. Because I don't know much about anything yet, um, but I do know that that's, this guy's probably really stressed. He's probably got a lot on his mind. And so I started communicating with everybody. I talked to my boss about this. I talked to the project manager about this. I talked to him about this. And they all started saying these things about uh, the project is, um, there's no priority. It's really hard to choose what to do. The team isn't necessarily communicating these priorities effectively. And so this gentleman is feeling like he has to take all of this on his shoulders, and it's leading to him to be stressed out. And so together, we made a plan. And again, I'm not an expert in this, but I do know my framework, and it has something to do with this. If I can impart this plan into people, if I can just tell people, or at least teach them how to learn, prioritize, communicate, and execute, then maybe he'll stop working 60-hour weeks, and he can come back to reality and enjoy his life. That's what we did. Let's put it into practice. Um, if you guys are familiar with Agile, it does a pretty good job of doing this. And so we started. We I built this spreadsheet for him. We have all this information on the left-hand side with descriptors, and then we have priorities um, in terms of what is important. Uh, we have a communication by which you can understand what you're working on. And then you have some sort of execution model where you can go through each and every day and understand exactly what people are doing and how long it's taking so you can actually do the work. And this, this was actually working. It was so good that we ended up adding another person. That was our iteration. We decided, okay, well, this is working, and now we need to get the person working under you to do it so you can communicate with her. And now we're, we've been iterating for about three months and the team is now fully on board, and they have this nice formal process. And most importantly, after those three months, he no longer works 60 hours, which is a win. Very good. And what I guess I'd say to you is, like, we're still iterating on what's important and how to do this. But with this function, I think we have a pathway to get to this because we're having teams communicate and now we can have communication between these different projects. Um, thank you. You can reach me at this email if we run out of time for questions and that's the QR code to my LinkedIn if you want to connect and just you know, stay in contact. Thanks. Um, I stayed in this room because it was the English room. So I, I didn't know what OMSF was beforehand, and uh, it was a really great talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I was wondering what you think the importance of the people working in the space really caring about what they're doing is for what they're doing, and how much of it is related to being open, and how much of it is related to it being full time. I think as you, um, let me go back a couple slides. This is, I, I really love this question. So the, the short answer is um, it's very important, mostly because um, we're a nonprofit. And being competitive with drug developers who work on software products in drug development space is almost impossible for our budget restrictions. So the people that we end up bringing on these top, I'd say this top tier right here of really senior developers have this desire, this like burning desire to work on open projects. This idea of open science is extremely attractive. Um, we have a very high retention rate of these people, uh, about five, three to five years, um, and they could very well go and get, you know, triple the salary, it'd be very easy. What's interesting here is like imparting those values to these, um, these people right below them because the job market's really hard right now. And so opportunities for people to find things that aren't just necessarily junior scientist at X pharma company or postdoc are limited. And so we offer this extra thing, but a lot of people are just like me, where it's like, where do I fit into the gray space? And um, we're hoping that 
senior people, people like me and people like you can impart these sort of open um, practices to make them feel really comfortable and really inspired to work in the space. Um, I was wondering if you have any strategies or resources for uh, increasing uh, usage of all of these open tools. Uh, how do you convince people to, to use the open tool as opposed to the proprietary tool, like other than cost? So we just had a symposium um, about two weeks ago, and I asked this question, like, do you use the software tools and what's stopping you? And the primary thing that's stopping people from using these tools is documentation. It's clear communication. Um, people would be happy to use the tools if they knew how to install them, right? Like if, they, if there was a clear guide that says like, okay, you just click this button and then there's this nice interface and everything goes as according to plan, it would be a no brainer. Um, again, this is like a funding issue, I think, where our priority is good science and strong software. Um, and documentation kind of falls through the cracks, especially people coming out of academia. It's like, if you know any grad student who's working on a software project, they are the only people who are ever going to use that software product, and so they're not going to document it. So it's not only just something that's important, it's a skill that, as organizations, we need to impart, and we need to make sure that we're communicating its importance. Does that answer your question? Okay. I really love your hypothesis about needing to increase community within individual teams before trying to build up between project communication. And you gave a great example of one particular issue, someone overworking, needing kind of more agile project management in order to reduce that problem. Um, do you have any ideas about um, other ways to increase that um, communication within a given project in order to move on to the ultimate goal of between project communication? Um, I think then you, first what you have to do is you have to make sure you're putting a necessary glue down. So whether, and this might seem intuitive, but if you're using Slack, if you're using Discord, you have to make sure that it's optimized to the way the team is communicating. I think regular meetings, actual physical meetings, we heard a great keynote about the importance of physicality. In this, uh, in this specific example, um, we are completely remote. So to have a work culture develop, we have to be able to see each other. And so I think that's just one really great passive way um, that makes sure that your team is ready and set up. Um, then there's a layer on top of that, which goes back to this documentation. You have to have very good meeting notes. If you're not going to have somebody do it, get an AI to do it. Um, you have to listen to the way people want to operate. The team I talked about it runs agile, and that works for them. But this other team runs completely waterfall. It's all Kanban. Everybody is trained to use that style. And I think if you are a manager, and you really want to increase the productivity and allow people to be connected, you have to listen to how they're going to work together and then offer that solution, rather than just coming in and like kicking the door down and, and saying, like, yeah, this is what you're going to do. This worked because this team had a culture already. And this just allowed them to do the work they wanted to do the way they wanted to do it efficiently. Is that a good answer? OK. <laughs> I guess two units of the organization operated under different um, styles of project management. How do you, how do you, how does that work um, in a way that uh, <laughs> uh, doesn't bring too much chaos within the organization? The first one is, it's a challenge. Um, but as, as we're kind of like looking through how I think of things, and we're looking through this iterative cycle, um, you have to prioritize. And so if the priority is truly making communities self-sufficient on their own, we can figure out how they all bridge together um, after they're all really healthy and really engaged, right? 
Um, but the second part is, uh, it is working. Like through the grace of God, it, it actually does work. So you can take um, open fold, you can run a protein, you can fold it, you can do everything. And then you can go into open force field and parameterize the force field, which means you can see how it fits in the target. And then you can see exactly how um, it is better with open free energy. And it's a software pipeline. So we're making good products with different sort of functions. And it's because the teams respond to those functions and they're really productive. Yeah, so the base building blocks are the same. So Python and GitHub, right? And then Google Workspace um, and Slack. Those are the basics. Um, everything else is kind of up to them. Um, and uh, yeah, it is a managerial load, but the OMSF exists to inform all the other teams on how teams are communicating. So everybody in OpenFold knows that Open Force Field is using Atlassian products like Confluence and Jira and Trello just to manage their projects. And everybody in Open Force Field knows that they're using Zenhub to sit on top of GitHub because of X reason. Um, and just that knowledge, that knowledge piece that OMSF provides allows them to, as they're thinking about what they need to do, um, make adjustments. Okay. <laughs>